Welcome to Miles CPA Review. I'm instructor Varun Jain and today we will start with the auditing part of the CPA exam. Now audit is a very powerful tool and as we know with great power comes great responsibility. So all you future CPAs out here remember that audit will very soon be your identity. You're all set to become powerful and responsible. Now to understand audit in a nutshell, we'll use a famous questioning technique known as the 5 W's and the 1 H. So we start with what is an audit? An audit is an examination of financial statements. Why is an audit done? It's done to express an objective opinion as to the fairness of financial statements as per GAAP. That's generally accepted accounting principles. Now audit makes the financial statements Credible. When is the audit done? After the management prepares the financial statements. Who does the audit? We, we the independent, the expert auditors, we do the audit and as part of the audit, we express an objective opinion on these financials which are prepared by the management. Guys, note the division of responsibilities out here. Management is responsible for the financials. We as auditors are responsible for our opinion on these financials. We are not directly responsible for the financials. Now, where do we report our audit findings? Where do we express our opinion? That's done on the audit report. Now, an audit report could have various kinds of opinion. Let's say we are happy with the financials. It's a clean opinion. We say they present fairly as per gap. In that case, we would give an unqualified opinion if we smell something fishy that's when we give a qualified opinion if we say the financials are shitty they're all cooked up we would give an adverse opinion there could be circumstances where we do not want to express an opinion that's when we give a disclaimer we'll talk about all these different kinds of opinion when we get on with the course so for now a clean opinion is an unqualified opinion something fishy that's qualified Shitty, that's adverse. We do not want to express an opinion, that's a disclaimer. So these are various kinds of opinion that we as auditors can give on the financials. Once again, management is responsible for the financials, guys. We are only responsible for the opinion that we give on these financials. Now, the big question, how do we do the audit? That's done by performing audit procedures as per US GAS, that's the generally accepted auditing standards. Guys, note, the financial statements are prepared as per GAAP. So management uses GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles to prepare these financials. They prepare these financials, give it to us. That's where we come in. We do our audit procedures as per US GAAS to express our opinion on these financials. Once again, management responsible for the financials. We as auditors responsible for our opinion on these financials. Now, in a moment, we'll talk in detail about gas. Let's get to the book, do a little bit of highlighting and we'll come back and I'll give you a lovely mnemonic to remember gas. Let's now look at page two of our audit intro. So you have the five W's and the one H for audit. Under what is an audit, I want you to highlight examination of financial statements. Under why, I want you to highlight to give objective opinion as to the fairness of financial statements in conformity with US GAAP. Under when is an audit done, highlight management is equal to prepare financial statements. So an audit is done after the management has prepared the financial statements. Under who does the audit? Highlight auditor is equal express opinion on financial statements. Let's now look at the chart that we have on the bottom of this page. So you have management preparing financial statements per gap. That's generally accepted accounting principles. Then the auditor comes and he does his audit per gas. That's generally accepted auditing standards. The result is we have the audited financial statements, which again is the responsibility of the management. 
and the audit report with an opinion on the financial statements. This is the auditor's responsibility. So it makes it very clear. Management is responsible for the financial statements. The auditor is responsible for his opinion on the financial statements. Okay, we just said that an audit is done by performing audit procedures as per GAS. That's generally accepted auditing standards. Now guys, GAS is the base on which our entire auditing spectrum is based. There are 10 auditing standards, 10 GAS. And I'll give you a magical mantra which will ensure that you remember these gas for life. So guys, I, as your audit instructor, give you a general tip. For you auditors, you CPAs, for you to go to the field, go to the client site, get there and take a field pick. So once again, it's a general tip from your instructor for you auditors to go to the client's side with the auditor's camera and take a field pick. After you're done seeing all that's happening there, come back and report all clean and dirty elements. Guys, you guys are auditors. You would report everything that you see, everything clean and especially if anything is dirty. So you report all clean and dirty elements. So guys, here we have the 10 gas on the board. So we have three general standards, the general tip that you have from your instructor for you to go to the field, take a field pick, three field work standards, come back and report all clean and dirty elements. That's four reporting standards. So you have three general standards, three fieldwork standards, and four reporting standards. In short, that's your 10 gas. Now, let's talk in more detail about each of these 10 generally accepted auditing standards. We will start with the three general standards, the general tip. The T of the tip stands for training and proficiency. So as an auditor, you're supposed to be properly trained and proficient. That's why you guys are all here, right? Because you want to be properly trained. You want to gather, gather in proper accounting education to become CPAs, to become good auditors. So training and proficiency comes from accounting education, practical experience in auditing, and certainly the industry knowledge in which you're going out and doing the audit. So that's your first general standard, the T of your general tip. The I of the tip stands for independence. That's very important. Now, independence is about being neutral. I don't hate the client. I don't like the client. It's about being objective, acting with integrity. Independence of an auditor ensures credibility. People believe in you because you are independent. Now, independence is required both in fact and in appearance. Now, let's think about it. Let's say you own 30,000 shares in a company with 100,000 shares outstanding and you go out and do an audit. Won't you want the company to do well so that the value of your shares increase so that your wealth increases? Yes, you would. Would you still be neutral? Certainly not. Your independence is impaired. In fact, because you own 30% of the company, you would want that company to do well. Think about a case where you own just one out of those 100,000 shares outstanding. Let's say one share of a $10, which is immaterial to you. Would your independence be impaired? Would you want the company to do really well? You don't care. I mean, it's just a small immaterial stake. But then the public is going to say that a shareholder of this company is auditing the company. Your independence now is impaired in appearance. So now the rules say that you should be independent both in fact and in appearance. So if you own 30%, that's your independence being impaired in fact. 
if you own just one share in material stake even then your independence is impaired in appearance we want to be properly safe guys we want properly credible audit reports we want credible auditors we want to make sure that audit reports carry a lot of credibility it people can believe in that so we need to have auditors properly independent now we'll talk about independence in depth when we go to the ethics and professional responsibility section let's move on with our general standards let's get to the p of our general tip that's professional care now i would call it due professional care this is to act with due diligence and ensure that there is no negligence you must exercise due professional care in planning the audit in performing the audit and in preparation of the audit report now you must observe the standards of field work and the standards of reporting it's about having an attitude of professional skepticism that's a questioning mind and critical assessment it's like i neither assume that the management is dishonest nor assume unquestioned honesty let's say uh, the client tells you that the allowance for accounts receivable in their company is 2% of the ending accounts receivable balance you don't say yes sir it's 2% neither do you say i don't trust you guys you say i need sufficient appropriate audit evidence to corroborate with this number 2% so that's about having an attitude of professional skepticism now i'll give you another concept here as auditors we are looking at reasonable assurance now guys absolute assurance would take ages so we give reasonable assurance regarding the financial statements let's take an example let's say we have a financial statement item which is let's say a million dollars now auditing every dollar of this million dollars that would be absolute assurance now that would take ages it would take us a long time to do an audit and give out an audit reports it would not make sense it would be too late so what we do is we determine a level of materiality so let's say we say $5000 is the level of materiality so anything below $5000 in this million dollars doesn't really matter so if it's a dollar $5 $10 doesn't matter but if it's more than $5000 it would matter so we determine the level of materiality and this becomes the scope of our audit for which we give a reasonable assurance again absolute assurance would be every dollar reasonable assurance is determining a level of materiality and giving a reasonable assurance based on that scope so that's about acting with due professional care guys very important so T is training and proficiency, I is independence, P is professional care. Get this to your head. Let's get to the book, highlight a bit and we'll come back and talk about the field work standards. On page 3, we have all the 10 gas listed down there. And I'm sure you remember my mnemonic, the general tip to take a field pick and report all clean and dirty elements let's look at the general standards on page 4 highlight three general standards and on the bubbles there I want you to fill T I and P that's the general tip let's look at the first general standard training and proficiency highlight that so it says audit must be performed by a person having adequate technical training and proficiency as an auditor as i told you you require accounting education practical experience in auditing and the industry knowledge in which the audit is being done next one highlight independence it says in all matters relating to the assignment and independence in mental attitude must be maintained by the auditor. It says independence is being neutral 
and act with integrity and objectivity so as to ensure credibility. Independence needs to be maintained, highlight this, both in fact and appearance, where fact is the real state of mind and appearance is how it appears to the public. The P of our tip highlight professional care. Let's read. It says, due professional care must be exercised in the performance of the audit and in the preparation of the audit report. Act with due diligence, highlight due diligence and ensure that there is no negligence. Critical review of the judgment used at every level. Observe standards of fieldwork and reporting. Obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence to limit audit risk. Preparation of complete work papers. Then we have the attitude of professional skepticism. Highlight this. It's a questioning mind and critical assessment of audit evidence. As I told you, neither assume management is dishonest nor assume unquestioned honesty. On the next bullet, I want you to highlight reasonable assurance. So we as auditors provide reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance that the financials are free of material misstatement, whether due to error or fraud. And then you have the concept of average auditor, which says that the auditor should exercise due professional care as an average auditor would and never less than the average auditor. Now that we've looked at the general standards, the three general standards, the general tip, let's get on to the field work standards, the field pick. The P of the field pick stands for planning and supervision. Now, as auditors, we are required to adequately plan the audit. That's about designing an appropriate audit program making sure everything that we do in an audit, all the field work standards, everything is properly planned in advance, as well as supervise audit assistance. Think about an audit team. So it's got an auditor in charge, that's the audit partner, a uh, couple of audit managers, a lot of audit assistants. The audit partner who's responsible, who signs on this opinion that he gives on this financials, he cannot say that the assistant did the job and it's just fine. He needs to make sure that the assistants are properly supervised. Now, let's move on to the eye of the field pick. That's internal control. Now, internal control is the process affected by the entity's management which makes sure that financial reporting, that's numbers that you have on the financials here, they're true, they're reliable, they're accurate. So it's basically the process that creates these numbers. That's internal control. Now guys, we've already said that management is responsible for these financials. We as auditors are responsible for our opinion on these financials. Similarly, Management is responsible for those internal controls. We as auditors are only responsible for our assessment of those internal controls. Now, the way we do it is management has internal controls in place. We step in, we look at those internal controls. We understand that. So we understand the entity, the environment of the entity and its internal controls. So we understand Now, depending on how good the controls are, we assess the risk of material misstatement on these financials. Now, think about it, guys. If the controls are very nice, the risk of material misstatement is low. If the controls are bad, they're pathetic, there's a high risk of material misstatement on these financials. So, depending on our understanding of internal controls, we assess RMM. Now, this risk of material misstatement, that is misstated numbers could be due to error, that's unintentional mistakes or fraud, that's intentional. So we assess that risk, whether due to error or fraud. Now, depending on this risk, we determine the net of our audit procedures. That is the nature, extent and timing of audit procedures, all the audit work we are going to do. 
that audit procedures includes test of controls, So test of controls is basically the test that we do on those controls that create these financials, that create these numbers. So that's test of controls. The second part, the last audit procedure is substantive testing when we do a test of the dollars that you have here. So guys, we are doing test of controls and we also do substantive testing. Test of controls is testing the controls that the management has in place. Test Substantive test is basically the test of the dollar numbers that you have on the financials here. So once again, we understand internal control which helps us assess the risk of material misstatement of these financial statements, whether due to error or fraud, which again helps us determine the nature, the extent and timing of audit procedures, which include the test of controls and substantive testing. Now let's get on to the C of a field pick that's corroborative audit evidence. Now guys this is our main focus we do all the hard work all the audit procedures to gather audit evidence. Now we can provide an opinion on the financials only when audit evidence is sufficient and appropriate. So basically you could say we need enough, sufficient, good, that's appropriate. So we need enough good audit evidence to provide an opinion on the financials. Now audit evidence generally is gathered by doing substantive testing. I told you right, audit procedures include test of controls and substantive testing. Substantive testing is the test of dollars. The moment we are testing transactions that happen during the year, account balances that you have on the financials here. We test disclosures. When we do all that testing, we gather in corroborative audit evidence. So guys, let's look at it together. So we have internal control phase where we perform test of controls. Depending on the results of test of controls, we perform substantive tests. Let's look at it in detail. Let's get on the board on that side. So let's say the entity has got strong internal controls. We say we can rely on internal controls. What does that mean? That means that we are okay with doing less audit work. We are okay with doing less of substantive testing. Doing less substantive testing, we are also okay with less evidence because when we do less work, we gather less evidence. So guys, you're looking at it, right? So if internal controls are very good, if management has proper, very strong internal control creating those numbers, the chances of these numbers being materially misstated is pretty, pretty low. And we say we really don't need a lot of work on these numbers. We think that these numbers are going to be correct. They're going to be true. So we do less work. Less work means less evidence. That's okay. Now, the standards do not require any particular amount of audit evidence. It does not say if it's a million dollar audit, you need to have 10 files of evidence. No, your audit evidence depends on your judgment. So if the internal controls are good, we as auditors, we are happy with less evidence. We don't need to do a lot of work. We need to make sure that the evidence that we have corroborates. So we need to make sure that we have enough evidence to be uh, able to give an opinion on these financials. How about when internal controls are bad? So let's say if our reliance on internal controls is low. So we go to the company and we say they've got pathetic internal controls, no internal controls. We really doubt that the numbers that they have on the financials here, they may be material misstated, materially misstated. So we could say there's a high risk of material misstatement. Now in that case, 
we decide we're going to do a lot of audit work. We're going to test every balance, every account that they have. So we're going to do a lot of substantive testing. If we do more substantive testing, naturally, we would have a lot of evidence. Because given shitty, pathetic internal controls, we will not be satisfied. We will not be able to give our opinion till we do a lot of substantive testing, gather a lot of evidence. So guys, I'm, I'm sure you're getting the relationship here. So if internal controls are good, how do we know if internal controls are good if you have to rely? Because we perform the test of controls. So test of controls tell us how good the internal controls are. Should we rely on them or shouldn't we rely on them? Depending on the results of the test of controls, we decide how much of substantive testing we want to do. Substantive testing give us the amount of evidence. So if it's a company, very systematic company, very good internal controls, we are happy with doing less audit work, gathering less evidence. Bad internal controls means more work and more evidence for auditors. So guys, this is all about your field work. Think about it. This is exactly what you do when you get onto your audit field work. So you first start with planning the audit, making sure that your assistants are properly supervised. Then you look at the internal controls that the management has in place. Again, management is responsible for internal controls. We are only looking at them. Depending on the internal controls, we perform the test of controls, which helps us decide whether to rely on those controls or not rely. If we rely on those controls, we think that we are happy with less audit work, less substantive testing, we gather less evidence. But if those controls are not so good, we would do more audit work, we would gather more evidence. On page 5, I want you to highlight the first line, three fieldwork standards. So the fieldwork standards deal with planning the audit, and accumulating and evaluating audit evidence. I want you to fill the bubbles P I C and we're talking about the field pick. Let's see the first field work standard planning and supervision highlight that it says the auditor must adequately plan the work, design an appropriate audit program, highlight audit program. Then we have supervision, which requires the auditor to properly supervise any assistance. It says the work of staff auditors must be reviewed by a qualified auditor. Let's get to the second fieldwork standard, the eye of a field pick internal controls, highlight that. It says that the auditor must obtain a sufficient understanding of the entity and its environment, including its internal control to highlight assess risk of material misstatement of financial statements, whether due to error or fraud. Next line says, determine the nature, extent and timing of audit procedures. Highlight this nature, extent, timing, net of audit procedures. Next bullet says, the appropriate internal controls provide confidence to the auditor that material misstatements will be prevented or detected and corrected on a timely basis. Highlight the next two sub bullets. Strong internal control implies that we need less substantive testing and less evidence. Also highlight weak internal control implies more substantive testing is required and more audit evidence. Let's look at the third fieldwork standard highlight corroborative audit evidence. And I want you to write there is equal to support auditors opinion, not financial statements. So guys, we have the corroborative audit evidence, which supports the auditors opinion, not the financial statements. Guys, we as auditors, we are responsible for our opinion. We are not responsible for the financial statements. So the evidence that we gather supports our opinion, not the financials. Let's read. It says the auditor must obtain sufficient and appropriate highlight sufficient and appropriate. 
So sufficient and appropriate audit evidence by performing audit procedures to afford a reasonable basis for an opinion regarding the financials under audit. It says all specific audit work performed to gather evidence. Standards do not require any specific audit evidence. It is based on the auditor's judgment. Now I want you to put a note there, right? Note weak internal controls or weak I slash C does not mean the financials are misstated. There might be a cases where the internal controls are weak, but the dollar number on the financials, they are true, they are fair. So it says weak internal controls does not mean that the financials are misstated. But the auditor needs to do more substantive testing and gather more evidence to support his opinion on the financial statements. So guys, I hope you're getting this point. Once again, weak internal controls does not mean financial statements are misstated, but the auditor needs to do more substantive testing and gather more evidence to support his opinion on the financial statements. So guys, we have now looked at the three general standards, the general tip that was training and proficiency, independence, professional care. Then we went on, we went out of the field. We took a field pick, P was planning and supervision. I was internal control. C was corroborative audit evidence. Now it's time for us to give out our audit report. That's where we said our audit findings are, right? So we have four reporting standards which guide us how to write that audit report. So now let's look at all clean and dirty elements. So the A of the all, that's the first reporting standards is whether accounting principles are in accordance with GAAP. So guys, this is a gas audit to make sure that the financials are as per GAAP. So we as auditors, we as CPS, we are doing a gas audit. The management prepares these financials as per GAAP. So our report must state whether the financial statements are presented in conformity with US GAAP. Guys, this is an explicit statement in our audit report. We clearly stated whether or not these financials are presented in conformity with US GAAP. That's generally accepted accounting principles. Now the second reporting standards, the C of clean, that stands for consistency. This is basically whether the management has consistently applied gap from year to year. Now consistency is implicit in the audit report. That is if the management has been consistent, if they've applied the same principles this year as they had applied last year, we say nothing. But if they have applied different principles, if they have changed gap, then we would mention it. So if we are silent in our audit report relating to consistency, that means everything's fine. But if we see that something has changed from last year, we would mention it on our audit report. The D that's dirty stands for disclosures. This is again implicit. Now disclosure means that the management has made proper disclosures in the financials. Again, if we say nothing in the financials, it means there are no omitted disclosures. So again, it's implicit. But if there's something missing, we would put it on our audit report. So guys, we report all clean and dirty elements where A stands for accounting principles in accordance with US GAAP. C is consistency. D is disclosures. Now E, that's the last gas. That's the fourth standard of reporting. This is expression of an opinion. 
Guys, this is why we are paid all the big bucks for to express an opinion on the financials. Remember, we had it right here. So we had the audit is done to express an opinion on the financials who gives the audit who gives the opinion we we the independent the expert auditors we give our opinion on this financials and we said we are responsible for this opinion so expression of an opinion is the most important thing that's why we are there that's why we are hired for this is the why of our audit now the expression of an opinion this again is an explicit statement So I already told you about the various kinds of opinion. So if it's an unqualified opinion, we explicitly state that the financials are presented fairly in accordance with GAAP. If it's qualified, we would say they are, there's something wrong. This is qualified is like an except for. If it's adverse, we would say they're not presented as per GAAP. So that's an explicit statement. Now, in case we cannot express an opinion, we need to give a disclaimer we need to state reasons why we are unable to give an opinion maybe we are not independent maybe we couldn't do enough audit work we couldn't do enough field work but in all cases wherever our name is associated with the financials our report should contain a clear-cut indication of the character of the work and the degree of responsibility that we are assuming in other words the scope of our work so guys now we have all the 10 gas here on the board. Now, as I told you, our, most of our audit syllabus is going to be based on these 10 gas. So I'll tell you how it's going to work. So in audit one, we're going to focus on the general standards. So this is going to be audit one, where our major, we're going to cover a major portion of the professional responsibilities and ethics that again deals with independence and professional care so that's audit one the general standards in audit two we'll get to the p of our field pick that's planning and supervision then in audit three we'll talk about the i of our field pick internal controls again management responsible for internal controls we come in we understand the internal controls we assess the risk of material misstatements and depending on our assessment, we perform the test of controls. Then we would move on to audit four, where we'll talk about corroborative audit evidence, which needs to be sufficient and appropriate. We would perform substantive tests in audit four. In audit five, we would learn about audit sampling. So when we're doing test of controls or substantive tests, we might not want to do the entire population. We might just want to pick up a sample out of that population. So that's what we're going to learn in audit five. Then in audit six, we're going to talk about these reporting standards. We're going to talk about how we write audit reports where we express our opinion. Again, opinion, unqualified, qualified, adverse, or even a disclaimer. Finally, we would wrap up with audit seven where we have all the miscellaneous auditing topics. We would talk about attestation engagements. We would talk about accounting and review services. So that's all there in audit seven. But as you realize, most of our audit is based on this gas. And whenever I start any class of audit, I'm gonna talk about this general tip from your instructor for you to get to the field, take a field pick, come back and report all clean and dirty elements. Let's hit the book and let's wind up the introduction in auditing. I'll see you again in audit one. Let's now look at page six of our audit intro. We're looking at reporting standards. Highlight the first line which says four reporting standards and fill the bubbles a, C, D, and E. That's all clean and dirty elements. Let's look at the first reporting standard. That's A, or accounting principles is equal to US GAAP. Highlight that. And put a note there which says, must state explicitly.
It says the auditor must state in the auditor's report where the financial statements are presented in accordance with GAAP. It's an explicit statement in the audit report. Next one, the C of A, C, D and E. That's the second reporting standard highlight consistency. And put a note there which says silence means OK. So silence equals OK. It says no new principles and there is consistent application of gap from year to year. It says the auditor must identify in the auditor's report those circumstances in which such principles have not been consistently observed in the current period in relation to the preceding period. So guys, if we say nothing, that means the financials are consistent. If the financials are not consistent, only then we mention them in the audit report. So that's why it's implicit in the audit report. The D of our all clean and dirty elements, that's the third reporting standard, highlight disclosures. And write again, silence equals OK. Let's read. Management has not omitted informative disclosures in the financial statements. When the auditor determines that informative disclosures are not reasonably adequate, the auditor must state so in the auditor's report. So guys, only when it is not adequate will the auditor mention this in his audit report. Otherwise, silence means OK. That's why we say it's implicit in the audit report. The fourth reporting standard I want you to highlight expression of an opinion. Very important. Right there is equal must state explicitly. The standard requires that the auditor must either express an opinion regarding the financials taken as a whole or state that an opinion cannot be expressed in the auditor's report. So there are two choices. First choice, express an opinion on the financials taken as a whole or disclaim an opinion stating reasons for the same. Then we have that in all cases where an auditor's name is associated with the financials, the auditor should clearly indicate the scope of the audit in the audit report. And the expression of an opinion is certainly an explicit statement in the audit report. So now let's look at page seven. Here you have a few points with regards to gas. The first point talks about the gas hierarchy. Naturally, the level one is the auditing standards. Now, gas comes out of the ASB or the auditing standards boards, the statements of auditing standards, which is applicable to non issuers. We learn that this is the AU code in your research simulations. For issuers, we have the PKBOOS or the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board's auditing standards, which we'll talk about in Audit 1. The level 2 of gas hierarchy is interpretive publications. These are not standards, but recommendations regarding how the statements of auditing standards should be applied in specific situations. Level 3 talks about other auditing publications. You can read that on your own. Let's move down on the page and look at auditing standards versus auditing procedures. I want you to highlight auditing procedures is equal to acts to be performed during the audit. Highlight auditing standards or gas. That's the measure of the quality of the auditor's performance of audit procedures. Now it says, Specific audit procedures needed to fulfill audit standards will vary for each engagement, but the standards always remain the same. This means that we would use different audit procedures on different engagements, but on all our audit engagements, we would have the same 10 gas that we have learned. So we've learned about the general tip to go out, take a field pick and report all clean and dirty elements. This applies to all audit engagements. 
Let's now turn the page and get to page 9 where we have a little appendix on authoritative literature which is tested on the audit research simulations. I wanted to highlight the first sub bullet there which says AU is the codification of statements on auditing standards. And draw an arrow down there to the next bullet. Let's read there. So it's the AU code codified as SAS or statements on auditing standards. So guys, the statements on auditing standards which define the gas are represented by AU code on your research simulations on the audit exam. So if you look at it, AU 100, that talks about introduction to the statements on auditing standards. AU 200, that talks about general standards, highlight general standards. AU 300, that talks about standards of field work, highlight that. Turn on to the next page, AU 400, that talks about reporting standards 1, 2 and 3, that's all clean, dirty, accounting principles equal to gap, consistency and adequacy of disclosure, highlight that. And you have AU 500, which talks about the last reporting standard expression of an opinion, highlight that. So guys, if you see the statements on auditing standards are more or less following the same gas pattern. Now, as I've been telling you, you don't need to remember any numbers out here. You just need to be aware of what fits in where. So that when you get a research simulation, you are able to research it up and find the right sections. Once again, there is no need to remember any section code. So guys, this was all on your introduction to audit. Now we will get on with audit one, where we'll talk about the general tip with a focus on the eye of our tip, that's independence.